everyone. I'm Mariel Hemingway. Welcome to Outcomes the Sun podcast with my partner, Melissa Yamaguchi. We have a great show today and we're for, we have an amazing guest and I'm kind of going to save that for just a minute, a minute longer because she really is extraordinary. Uh, her name is Mary Hayashi. You may know her. She's a California state representative. But first of all, we kind of wanted to start the show just kind of catching up. Melissa and I uh, speak every day and you know that because you've listened to our show. But um, so it's been kind of, it's been an extraordinary time for me. I just wanted to kind of tell you about, I am now a grandmother. I think everybody knows that because I put some ridiculous thing on my uh, Instagram about, wow, I've become a grandmother. I was driving from Idaho to California and she had been in labor for 36 hours, my daughter, Dre. And um, anyway, I am now a grandmother and I have an extraordinary little granddaughter named Luce Byra Hemingway de la Sante, really Luce de la Sante, which means light of the saint. So that's an exciting uh, development. And the other thing is I just got back from Arkansas, which is a place that I made a movie called God's Country Song, which is about a country singer. And I play a grandmother. It was kind of the prelude to my life experience of becoming a grandmother. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to share that with you, Melissa, because I just know that you need to know everything that's going on well, in my life. We do share everything. And I just, yeah. your little peanut is one of the sweetest little things I've seen. Mm -hmm. I love all the pictures that you post. I'm glad you're able to share. You know, when I first had my children, I was always hesitant. Social media wasn't what it is today. No. But I was always a bit hesitant to give out too much, but I'm I'm always happy and pleased that you're able to share a few snippets here and there of little baby. She's just a precious little soul. She is so, oh my gosh. And it's so funny because, and I remember this now, I, I remember so many things about the birth of, of especially Dre, because she was the first child and, you know, it's all so extraordinary. But I remember that kind of this deep falling in love I mean, it's just so, and it's so profound and the yeah. feelings are so strong that it's so, it's so sweet because when I go to visit her and the baby and, and it really is her and the baby, because I get as emotional about seeing the baby as I do about seeing my daughter being a mother. I mean, it chokes me up to even think about it. It's so, I mean, just to see how she is with her, but all be holding her and she misses her after like five minutes. I'm like, wait, what? what? <laughs> what can I? Yeah, I get it. But I get it because I yeah. get you remember that feeling that you're just you're physically you're in pain, the pain of love. It's it's, true. Uh, it's astonishing. It's and, it, and, it, and you're reminded as a as a grandparent of of that you know that memory comes back and it's so visceral yes. and so powerful and beautiful and and she's uh, you know my daughter's just doing an extraordinary job i'm so proud of her i'm i mean i really is. am it's it's cuz you know it's not easy it's not easy no it's not easy but she had she had a good mentor she well had a good mentor well and yeah. you you traveled home from arkansas i just got yes. home from texas mhm mm you know where everything's bigger and I had, and I spoke to a group of HR people who, oh, are, yeah. who've really been, um, you know, struggling, struggling yeah. with this whole, a, a lot of different regulations and rules are being placed on them and, and they love their job, but there's this terrifying notion that you could make a mistake. Oh yeah. And it's not just making a mistake, an innocent mistake could easily get you in trouble if yeah. you say the wrong thing in your recruitment Yeah, somebody coming into your company. So there was a lot of stress on this group. And so when I went to visit them, you know, I, it was a motivational group uh, that a motivational talk, excuse me, that I gave and to lift their spirits. And I gave it the old college try. So I, I, I felt, I feel for them, you know, it's, it's, it's rough enough knowing, learning how to navigate. Right. With, with each generation. Cause they're also. Yeah. yeah. Then to also have governmental and federal regulations, state regulations, government regulations, everything coming at you. It's a dot. It feels as though it's a very daunting task. Yeah. Good, good on the company for bringing their teams together nationwide and just giving them a big pat on the back and letting them know how honored they are. 
Yeah. Well, they have they have a person perfect person in you. Um, I don't know if any of our audience members have heard you speak, but you're an amazing speaker, but you're also incredibly funny, which is such a it's such a delight for, you know, when I don't know when you're speaking and sometimes you're trying to pay attention and trying to get tips and you're trying. But when somebody has humor and they infiltrate that humor into it, it makes it I don't know. I think you take it in more when there's an emotional, visceral reaction to, to yeah. what you're saying, but you are an extraordinary Thank speaker. You, so if anybody, and, you and I met, I know I met from me speaking, introducing yes. the speaker. So we were speaking oh, and laughed and walking. She, down you made me stage. laugh so hard that I, I sat in the audience, at, you know, and she was introducing me and I sat in the audience and I thought, I want her to be my friend. She's so fun and funny. And I love laughter. I think laughter is like the most healing the thing that you can do in your life. Right. He laughter really is healing. You know, it's it is, it is the best medicine. Laughter is the best medicine. It really is when laughter and then talking about love and my grandchild, grandchildren. Oh, there's a Freudian slip. Oh, <laughs> I'm the grandchildren. Your daughters are listening, going, <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Laylee's like, I did I say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's my other daughter, by the way. Anyway, not married. Neither of them are. But that's a whole, you know, like, I guess you don't need to be this day and age. Our generation was completely different. We were. Not, well, it's not the first time in history. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true enough. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been, it's been an incredible time. And now I'm down in California. That also is a big shift. I have come from, as you know, I was in Idaho for two years, for the last two years. Um, I grew up there. But I had forgotten that winter is an incredibly long time. Winter goes on for seven months. It's okay, it's let's just be so honest cool. about this. It is so, I mean, it's wonderful. It's extraordinarily beautiful. The air is so clean. It's so fresh. It's it so amazing. But man, that long winter. Bam. It'll Ooh. test your gills. It'll test your gills, that's for sure. But you know oh what? I'm so, I'm so selfishly so glad to have you back because I know you're just oh, it's so far fun. away from me. So I can I know it's so good. Meet up in little favorite Johnson. It just tickles my fancy. So I'm selfishly glad you're back. Yeah, it's 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 really it's really fun and seeing the sunrises in the morning and the cats. Yeah, get I talk to you and I can hear the ocean crashing and I'm like, okay, Mary, you're taking this too far. <laughs> the ocean. Oh, and then your dog's trapped and tangled up with seaweed. I'm like, she's really <laughs> diving straight into California, man. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was Daisy. I have a, I have a Yorkie who is a, a year old and she, she somehow got some seaweed that, uh, attached to her small little, you know, seven pound body. <laughs> And she was growling at it, <laughs> literally like doing spins in the air. It was the cutest thing ever. Anyway, so yes, those are my mornings when I'm talking to you. And now I have crashing waves in the background. Very oh, dramatic. Yeah. It's so romantic. It just, and it's very dramatic. Full-fledged <laughs> Californian, very... right back into it. Oh my gosh. Well, this is, this is so cool. Um, well, I think that we can take a little break because I really am anxious to talk to our guest. Me too. So uh, hang on, everybody. You are listening to Out Comes the Sun podcast radio, and we will be back in a second with Mary Hayashi. And we're so excited today on Out Comes the Sun because Mary Hayashi, our guest, is an award-winning author and is among this country's most accomplished advocates for gender equality. As a national health care leader, public affairs consultant, and former California State Assembly member, Mary has, Mary has championed meaningful reforms to expand the delivery and coverage of health care and has established unprecedented partnerships in support of social causes that previously had no financial or public backing. You are the woman of the hour. You are the woman of the moment. We need to talk to you. This is really vital stuff. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you, Melissa and Mariel. Such an honor to be with you today. I just oh, cannot adequately express 
my appreciation um, to you and, and, and for both of you for doing what you're doing today and more. And Mariel, you've been an inspiration to so many people like me and others you know, who just, you know, didn't have a voice. And <sighs> you make it possible to, to others, for, for others to, to, to become active and become leaders. And so I'm just honored to be with you today. Thank you. Well, I, I, I want to show, well, I, we're thrilled to have you. I want, I want our audience to, to know a little bit about our, our relationship because we, we met in 2004, we met in an, at an event and I guess I was the keynote speaker. I don't recall it. At the time. <laughs> I, 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 I remember meeting you and the impact that you had on me. And, and, and I remember you connecting with me and, and we have kind of had a, distant but but we've had a relationship over the years and I've watched you in your career really make a difference in women's lives in regard to mental health and as you know outcomes of sun is really a it's a discussion about mental health but let's face it mental health is everything we do right it's everything it's all, it's how you react with your, in your relationships, with your family, with your children, with your siblings, what have you. And, and you have been incredibly impactful at making a difference at a governmental level, at, at a level that literally makes a difference, you know, and that's why I'm so imp impressed and actually honored to have you here. And I, and I also want um, our audience to know that I, wrote the forward to your book because I think the book is important. I think it's important for people to read. And I also did a little video for you. And um, I just, you know, what you're doing, as you know, and we could go on and on about, you know, uh, complimenting each other. But, but the important thing to know is that for everybody listening, women and men alike, mm -hmm. everybody can make a difference by speaking up, by speaking out, by doing something, right? And, and that's how we, how we can help one another. I, I always say to, to people, it's like, just, you know, for me, it's like, take care of yourself first, right? Because ultimately you have to take care of yourself and then you start taking care of the people around you. And um, that leads me to a delicate subject because you come from a family not dissimilar to mine. There are there are suicide in your family. And that was kind of your that that led you on your path sort of to this mental health journey. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what happened to you in your family, because it's it's pretty amazing and, and heart wrenching. Yeah, and I um I, I love your book too because you know just talking about your family so openly like that, Muriel, it's so important because you know in, in sort of the political scientist world, we call that a role model effect. You know, you can't be what you can't see. So when you see examples, when you see people like you speaking out, um, and, and that makes it okay for others yeah. to speak out. I mean, that really has an amazing effect. And, um, you know, what led me to a, a lifetime of public service and mental health advocacy, um, you know, is, is that I lost my older sister to suicide when she was 17 years old and I was 12. Oh. And, you know, in my culture... <laughs> you know, with, especially girls, we're, we're not supposed to, to, you know, seek help. We're not supposed to talk about our problems. You know, we're supposed to be respectful, silent, mm -hmm. you know, and we're really there to support the family and we don't bring shame. And, and, you know, we don't talk about anything that is stigmatized, you know, and, and so the morning that she hung herself in our room, she showed me, um, you know, these package of pills that she had taken in the tr trash can. And she said, you know, she said, look what I did. And she told me about this. And I, and I said, well, wh what's going on? And, and she said, please don't tell anyone, please don't tell anyone. And I didn't. And I left the home. This is January 1st of 1980. I, it was a new year. It was January 1st. It was new year's day. And we basically go to our relatives homes to, to wish them, you know, new happy new year and things like that. 
And, you know, when I came home, she, you know, um, my parents told me that she hung herself that day. And so I, 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 I spent my entire life trying to, to sort of figure out how I could have helped her. And, and, and the bottom line is because our culture celebrates silence as a strength, I mean, there was just no way for me to really help her. There's, you know, because to be a good girl is to be quiet mm -hmm. and not say anything. Um, and so that experience, I think, really shaped, um, you know, my entire sort of mental health advocacy for, you know, three decades for, for women and, you know, for, for every, you know, for underserved communities, because if we can't even talk about getting help, then how are we ever going to prevent suicides or help people get the treatment that they need? Um, yeah, so that, you know, so that's what happened to, to my sister. And, you know, my parents burned all of her belongings. We've oh, never had a funeral for her because in our culture, it's like it's better to just pretend that she doesn't exist. Oh, she never there is, is that culturally it's, it's shameful, correct? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I, I don't know what my parents told other, like their friends or what, the, you know, what, oh. what, you know, the community the neighbors knew about, you know, what exactly happened, right. but this wasn't something they were going to, you know, tell the world. No. So, no. so I don't even have, like, I have, I think I have like two pictures of her like from a long time ago, but I don't really have anything you know because they, they they burned everything they got rid of sort of all the evidence that she ever existed oh my gosh so that so that's kind of how our culture and our family dealt with her death yeah and so here I am you know for the past 30 some years I've tried to find out what happened to her what what yes. I could have done what I can what I should do what how I should help people and so many people have connections to mental illness. I mean, oh, I'm sure yeah. you know that. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, <laughs> and you know, when we invited you as the keynote speaker, um, by the way, that was the most successful fundraiser of the Proposition 63 campaign, Mariel. So oh, um, it was it was in San Francisco, um, and it was it was like you know, like my personal dream to meet you anyway, but. I was like, we have to get Muriel to come and speak to us and have this fundraiser. And Proposition 63, as you know, it's it's you know it's a tax on millionaires to create mental health money because when Ronald Reagan many many decades ago closed all the health, mental health hospitals, the exactly. community community systems were supposed to take care of the mentally ill, but you know the money never came, and so the Prop 63 has been funding great mental health programs, housing, education, training programs. And we were so happy to pass that ballot measure with your help. I mean, that's where I met you when you came to yeah. speak to us. And, you know, since then, you know, I have sort of ventured on to, you know, other um, other jobs, other career, you know, I ran for office. I One of the first legislation that I authored um, was AB 509 which was to create Office of Suicide Prevention for California. Because when I got to the legislature, I was like, we don't have the Office of Suicide Prevention in the Department of Mental Health. So that was one of my first bills. And so I continue to work in mental, you know, mental health advocacy and, you know, and just thinking about my, you know, sister and, you know, how I couldn't help her. Nobody could help her because of our culture. And just wanting to, you know, just continue to just do good and do continue to, you know, work on mental health issues the right. way you know you have been. And after I turned out of the the legislature, I was thinking a lot about, you know, women legislators, why they run, what kind of issues yeah. they work on, and that's that's where the sort of the book comes in because. You know, studies have shown that women politicians view themselves as, um, you know, voice for the voiceless. You know, we take yes. on issues that are very personal to us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, children, families, you know, healthcare, education. 
And, and I'm not saying men don't. I mean, obviously they do care, but they're, they're, the reasons for them running are a little bit different. They run because they seek a leadership position. That's kind of what the studies show. And I think the most um, sort of the famous person or like a good example is, is Bill Clinton. You know, he said he wanted to run for president because um, he met, um, you know, President Kennedy and shook his hand and he went back and said, I want that job someday, you know, and that's yeah. why he went. <laughs> right, right. Such a different, but what you're saying is, it, it, I mean, you've, you've covered so many avenues of what mental health and the discussion about mental health is about. First of all, shame. Second of all, people that, you know, the voiceless, the, the not being heard, nobody understands. And then thirdly, which is where you've been so profound, is that that people don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. That's where Melissa and I came together and said, let's start a foundation. And, you know, our dream is is to raise enough money so that we can be a resource navigator so that we can just so people can plug in and say, OK, in California, you go here. Here's the suicide prevention thing. But there's nobody either nobody knows or some states don't even have these opportunities. Yeah. And it's the little foundations throughout the country that I've spoken at quite a few of them that are doing something. And, and what you've done is made it imperative that, that the, that states do something because you doing that in California was an influence, I think on many states, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Because well, you, you your story just blows me away. I, I, I just, I <laughs> tear up thinking, I just, and, know, and family. I mean, I haven't really shared this with a lot of people, but you know, my mother passed away about a month ago oh, and sorry. I mean, it's, you know, and I mean, you know, when parents get old, they pass away and it's like, you know, you expected, you know, but she's also struggled with, you know, depression and things like that throughout her life. And it's just, like you said, it's just some, even though I'm a professional, you know, I've been in this field for decades, but there's so many times when I just felt like I couldn't help her, you know, you just, that helplessness is so difficult. And that's why I love the goal of your foundation, because it's, you know, e even professionals, we don't always know what to do. We no, don't. It's true. I had somebody come to me. I mean, that is so interesting that we're talking about this. I had somebody come to me that, you know, they're super, that, you know, they have enough money. They are influential. They're connected to so many people. And she, you know, she had a, a son that was going through trouble and didn't, you know, did not know where to go. I was like, what? You don't know where to go? And that's the thing. And Melissa and I are just like, what? It's so, but, you know, but that's how it's people like you. It's me getting up and making a stink. It's Melissa and I talking about it. <laughs> you know, that's how you make change. And and it's not always, always easy because there still is a stigma. I mean, people it's gotten better. People now talk about it. People say you got to talk about it. I mean, it's being spoken about, but still when it happens in your family, you know, your own fi family dynamic can shape the way that conversation goes. And, and so, you know, I just applaud you. Well, thank you. And again, you know, uh, you know, when I was growing up and my parents tried to, um, you know, do this, like this arranged marriage thing. Like they're like, Oh, we want you to marry somebody we like. <laughs> this is get very, wow. well, it's very common in my culture. Um, yeah. Melissa's like nodding her head. Did you have the same experience or no? My husband is Japanese. So I'm right here with you, sister. I'm right here with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they try to do this arranged marriage thing. And initially I was like, Oh, maybe I need to go along because you know, the good girl thing again, right? And I talk about that in my book a lot because I've learned, you know, through just reading about like other women's struggle that this is this is not just me. It's, it's happening here too because, yeah. you know, women aren't supposed to, to be aggressive or assertive or confident. And, you know, in politics, we talk about this ambition gap, this political ambition gap that, you know, 
men are encouraged to to run for office, whereas women think about going into a nonprofit. You know, you know, women are not necessarily encouraged to to you know seek power, and and so we have this political ambition gap in politics where we don't have gender parity because more men are encouraged to go into politics. Right. Yeah. And, right. and, and at the same time, you know, we're evaluated differently and we evaluate ourselves differently. Like there's a really interesting study that uh, it's called men rule and 60% of the men who were interviewed said um, they were not qualified. They, they, they saw themselves as very qualified to run for office and two thirds of women surveys said they were not qualified, even though they had the same qualification. And those men who said they were not qualified to run said that they will still run anyway. <laughs> so, wow. It's kind of wow. like that. You know, yeah. have, you that, have you heard of that study where like women don't apply for jobs unless they check every qualification? Like, right. Like, unless like I'm qualified 100%, I don't apply for those jobs. It's very similar in politics where women don't run because they're like, oh, I'm not qualified, even though they are. Yeah. And it's so when I so when I read about those things and, and you know, again, just going back to, you know, my culture and my parents try to like marry me off. I, I started reading about Gloria Steinem and I started reading about other feminist writing and that really helped me because, you know, growing up in Korea and coming here when I was 12 and came here six months after my sister died, didn't speak any English, grew up in Orange County where there were like maybe five Asian Americans and people used to call me Connie, Connie Chung. Um, that's my maiden name. And it was like, they didn't know any other Asian person. So that's yeah. what they would call me. Oh my God. And just growing up in that environment and really being isolated yeah. and not being able to, to talk to anybody about what happened to my sister, reading about what, like feminist and, and, and Jane Eyre and these literatures were just, I mean, it was just so liberating to me. And I think that's one of the reasons why I keep wanting to write because I don't really enjoy writing, but I keep wanting to write because that's how I want to help other women. Yes. I'm so inspired. You know, like when I read your book, I was like, my God, I just love the way you talk about your family so openly, you know, and it just takes so much courage. It does. Well, you're, and, you're, you're doing this, you're doing the same and you're doing you it on, it. on a platform, <laughs> whatever. I think we're just, I think we just love each other. <laughs> For plum <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, seriously, I mean, but Melissa and I understand that we understand that it, it, it's, it's very challenging what you've been through, but for you to have come from what you came from and for you to get into politics and really get into a world where, and also becoming a politician with power, you're not only, you know, you're not only a woman, but now you're, excuse me, you're a bitch, right? Isn't that what everybody thought you were, right? You, because right. you're strong and you have a voice that you must be, you know, she's, why is it that women are always considered like, because, bitch right. or I mean, you no, know, because of their power. Exactly. And it's, it's that, you know, it's that gender bias and it's, it, you know, it's what I call this, what I call this, likability double standards in my book um when in this and this you know there's a very famous study when the media talks about women politician in any way positive or negative or neutral and mentions her looks her appearance her likability just plummet. Voters no longer see that person as a leader. I mean, it's, it's a really big study that was done. And, and so, what, I mean, so think about that for a second, because I mean, like nobody writes about what Bernie Sanders wears, right? Like, right. He, I mean, we don't care what he looks like. We just, right. we just love him, you know? But can you imagine if Bernie was a woman? what they would, what, I mean, what the press would write about. Right. What, they, what they would write about was the fact that he doesn't smile enough. <laughs> the smile, right. the, smile right. is the one thing they keep slamming women for. She's not smiling enough. She's not, you know, I wanted to say something to you because you talked about, if, if I could slide back about the cultural thing for a second. Um, 
in I'm, I met an older man, an older Japanese man who's passed one of our uh, recently passed. He was a dear friend of my husband and mine. He, he passed away at 103 recently. Um, and he told me the story of being in the internment camps. And prior to him being in the internment camps, he was his mother had passed away when they came from Japan. And then shortly thereafter, his father remarried. The new stepmother was abusive towards him. Mm. And so he would run away all the time. And then the father finally and the mother, the stepmother said, we don't want to deal with him. So he was placed in foster care. And then he was sent to an internment camp. So you're looking at strike after strike after strike. And then the father passed away. So he had nobody and gets out of the internment camp um, and works his backside off, puts himself through USC. And he told me that he would meet other young Japanese girls that he would he'd like to meet and he would take out on a date. But when they found when their parents found out that both of his parents had passed, they wouldn't let their daughters date him. And the line was, he's so bad, even his parents had to leave. So his parents had to leave this earth because he's not worthy. And that was the stigma that carried him around. And I said, how did you ever overcome that? I mean, he had so many barnacles on his ship, if you will. And he said, I overcame it because the, the girl that I fell in love with said, I don't care what anybody says. I, you know, I love you. And he said it was the power of her love for me that allowed me to keep moving forward. He became wildly successful. He was driven by love. He lived to be 103. His, his children, like in their 80s, as like row instructors at Stanford and like wildly successful man. But this, the, the cultural stigma that was attached to him, that was very painful for him. I understand that's why I was shaking my head. Yes, a lot of it. My, my, my husband is the only son and he's the baby. And then loud comes this loud mouth white girl, you know, right? So I, it, there was a little bit of fear and trepidation about me marrying into the family and what I was going to be like. And I'm still loud, but hey, I can make some really good Asian dishes. I have completely embraced the Asian culture. I love the Asian culture. My children have Asian names, like I'm in. And so, but it took a long time for me to break through. So the cultural thing is huge. And I want to, I want to bring up something that you brought up in some of your, your points that you've made on your site, in particular, that I think so important for our audience to go to the maryhayashi.org site. You have a comment on there, if I may be so bold as to read, that we're lacking in positions in the state of California, significant shortage of mental health care professionals in California. Yes. Marilyn, I know that, like she just said, we she just got an email a couple of days ago with someone saying, I don't know where to go. Yes. Not only is there a shortage of them, but when they there are the positions, you made a fascinating point that I think we got to highlight. The positions are undervalued and underpaid. So yes. there's no seduction yes. to go into the industry. Yep. Yep. That's horrible. I mean, that's crazy. That. So what do we do? Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> what do we do? Well, do, you do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're following your lead. Well, okay. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yes. It, it, it the, the the mental health workforce issue is so huge, Melissa. I mean, it, right now, I, I mean, you, you guys, you, you don't need any more statistics, but I, you know, I saw this big story about kids extending their stays in emergency rooms just because they don't know where to put these kids. They don't know what to do with them. So they come in because they attempt suicide or they have suicidal thoughts or they're a danger to themselves. And emergency rooms are now overcrowded with children because they don't know, they don't know who to send it to. Yeah. And so, they don't know what, and they haven't been trained on what to do in a mental health emergency. And they don't think of it as an emergency, or if they do, they medicate, but they medicate inappropriately. I mean, there's so many things that can yes. happen in those very critical hours. I yes. mean, I think there just has to be something implemented about educating our, you know, because our emergency care system is fabulous in this country. But when it comes to mental health, That's everybody's right. at a loss. Yes. Except these okay. smaller organizations, but nobody knows where those are. Right. You know, it's really, it's really problematic. And, you know, suicide is an epidemic, especially with kids right now. How, 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 so how is that? It's so sad. It is. Right now, the, the statistics are really just really, really out of this world. I mean, record high. 
But I want to make a couple comments in response to what to do because, I mean, the legislature, you know, they didn't pass it, but they were debating a bill, which I thought would have been a great thing for, for the field, um, is to, to, to do this loan forgiveness program. So if you studied mental health and you have tuition debt and you decide to go into a mental health field, mm -hmm. then we would have a program where we would pay off your student loan. Oh, oh my gosh. Right? The tuition reimbursement so, program. That's on your. That's the information I saw on your side. Is that what you're talking yes, about, Mary? Yes. Yes. So okay. I really want, I mean, so we, you know, hopefully someday we'll have that bill, you know, we, we could pass that legislation because we need to value those who do this kind of work, this is so important. You know, yeah. we can't just pay. You brought, you brought up something so important because one of the things that I talk about when I speak to groups, because it's not just the people suffering, it's the people that are suffering that are helping the people that are suffering. And nobody addresses that. You know, the people, it's like you, the people left behind after a suicide, there's tremendous trauma mm -hmm. in, I mean, you spent a lifetime trying to overcome that trauma and nobody realizes that the people left behind are kind of going, holy crap, my and life is like, like, I don't know how to, de I don't know how to move forward. How do I move forward? Yeah. 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 And then another um, bill that, that I authored, which was signed, you know, became law, which I'm really proud of is um, AB 235. And it's, it has to do with not requiring prior authorization from insurance companies when people are admitted to emergency rooms with psychiatric problem. Yes. Yeah. So you know, um, you know, when you're admitted, you know, you, if you if you have a cut, they treat your cut, and you're released. Mm -hmm. Well, in a psychiatric emergency, you can't just release them after you give a medication or a one-time counseling. And insurance companies would force them to release those people early because they don't want to pay, or you have to go get prior authorization. So I authored I authored a bill. It was 2010, basically saying insurance companies cannot require prior authorization if the person is admitted with a psychiatric emergency. So if they need to stay in emergency for a week, then they have to cover that automatically. And the doctors and the hospitals don't need to get prior authorization from the insurer. So I'm really proud of that work Excellent. that we've done. Oh, that's because, amazing. Excellent. Congratulations. Because when I see, I mean, because when I see these kids stuck in an emergency room because they got nowhere to go, I'm thinking, oh, thank God, at least, you know, they're being covered <laughs> by their yes. insurance. So I, I know the, the, the progress is slow, but I feel like, you know, all of us, you know, who care, we just, we, you know, we just have to keep going. We just have to keep doing this and, and make a difference in whatever capacity, you know, whether in the legislature or through a book or, you know, through your foundation. I think that's yeah. amazing. You know, I want to help you. Please tell me how I can. Oh, you're amazing. You're helping us. You're helping. You're talking about this helps us. And, and I also want to remind our, our amazing, uh, our, our amazing followers and listeners to get your book because your book is extraordinary. Women in politics, uh, go to maryhayashi.org to get your book because it's, it's very, very important. And um, tell us your call to action. So call to action in my book um, because, you know, women have to, you know, the, when I interview these women about their journeys and their leadership stories and their lessons um, and, and, you know, combining with the research that, that I've been able to gather to kind of put together this book, what, what was very clear to me is that the, the journey requires momentum, tenacity, and resilience. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not this one magic moment. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's this continuation. It's just like story. It, it goes on. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the book is unique because it, it elevates the conversation around women's voices in politics. But what I try to talk about are things like my sister's death, mental health. You know, I have a, yes. I have a legislator who, you know, um, 
you know, talked about her own experience in, with sexual abuse. Yes. Um, so I try to talk about why women are in politics, why we do this, because that's really important. Um, it, it and is so important. my main message is that, you know, role modeling um, is, is really, you know, important because I had a male mentor who got me involved in the Proposition 63 campaign and and he gave me the idea to run for run for office. And so it's not just about women mentoring women, but it's also men. We need men allies to help us. And, and the studies have shown that when men talk to other men about gender bias, they're more likely to listen yeah. and, and comprehend. And so we need men to help to, 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 to get to political parity. And also, you know, in 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 our world, we call this imagination barrier. We need to like we can't be what we can't see, and so it's incredibly wow. important to be role models for others, and especially with the new younger generation of women leaders coming up, running for office. It's exciting, but it's 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 a journey. You know, it's it's not a one magic moment. So I'll just no, leave you with that. That's it's so true. Well, I bet you are a mentor to many. To many. There. I bet there are women. Yeah, you're a mentor to me as well. So, and a role model. So, I, you know, the, your role modeling thing is fantastic. This conversation is so important and so exciting. And Mary, we are so honored that you you joined us today to talk about this important subject. I mean, all these important subjects, all the many things that you've done and made an impact. So, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really honored and I hope you'll come back and if Melissa I can ask one thing if yes I, you can keep us abreast of what you're doing and and any initiatives that we can help promote because it's important this is an this is an impact across the borders across the lines right the lines of divination that we've that we that have been placed before us whether it's through race or gender or political or religious whatever they are this supersedes everything so anything that you're working on that we can bring to highlight for our audience, please keep keep it in yeah. touch with us. We'd love to support. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. It's just, I'm so <laughs> excited that you're here. It's just so much fun. We'll have to talk later. We'll have to meet. <laughs> yes. I'm coming to Venice. I listened to your podcast oh, from yesterday. <laughs> I was like, good. oh, good. She's back in California. Now I yes. can Oh, I'm back. Her. I'm in your state, baby. You come. Yeah, and I, and I loved your, by the way, I loved your um, Seven Doctors podcast. Oh, yeah. Episode. Oh, good. I love that because I think one thing that, that we really need, professional women, are those simple things that we can yes. do every day to just be well you know yeah one breathing exercise I was like hello you know just I know I that episode. It's the simpler things that are the, that are the ones that we should do and it's the ones we forget to do we think there's some it's kind of like you were talking about it's not one magic day it's not one magic solution it's like a combination of all these different things so anyway mary thank you so thank much you. you're an amazing guest you're an amazing woman please go to maryhayashi.org order your book it's amazing thank you and i did write the forward i'm just gonna say <laughs>
her daughter and her family, like getting rid of all of her things, that blew my mind. Oh my I, God. It, it, well, it made me think of my friend Francis and how people wouldn't let their daughters date him. So there's oh. this incredible shame. Yeah. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's, Listen, it's, it's, um, and her mother had depression later on in her yeah. life. That, so that the, 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 she probably had depression she carried it with her. Yes. Yeah, forever. I mean, I'm sure, and, and never could deal with it, you yeah, know, and true. so many cultures are still in that predicament. Yep. Let's uh, go to a different note. I want you to give this, this is a new thing in our podcast. We're going to talk, we're going to have a little, we're going to have a little tips. And our first is coming from you. I want you to talk about Feng Shui today. And I want you to give us a little tip. I'm something. more than happy to. Yeah, so please. It, we're going to be hitting this every week, but what the tip that I want to share with our audience today is the feng shui of your bedroom. And I didn't say your boudoir. I said your <laughs> <laughs> So let's in I in in feng shui, your bed is your haven. And it is for everybody, but in feng shui, we focus on the energy of your room. So I want to, the tip is I want you to focus on your sheets, the temperature of your room, your mattress, your pillows, and the quality of light is there a lot coming in your room the sound in your room that's are, those are good health tips that i know you given the seven doctors but in feng shui that's also a very huge tip in feng shui is to understand that when you get into your bed your the feng shui tip is to have everything else blocked out just where that bed becomes a cocoon and embraces you so that you can rest peacefully and approach tomorrow rested so you know, I, I did a speech recently where I was telling the audience, I don't spend a lot of money on shoes and purse. I really put it more into the sheets and to the <laughs> pillows and the mattress. And I just got blackout shades, which if they were a person, I would divorce my husband and marry him because what they have done for my life is so massive. It's just amazing. And so I, the, the feng shui tip is not a lot of pictures in your room. Interesting. You know, uh, you don't, it's, the, it's the energy of the faces on you. And I've had people say to me, but I've got a picture of my parents on the side. I've got a picture of my kids on the side. Find another spot for them if you can. If we're going to follow the true feng shui, the room is supposed to be a haven and it's supposed to cocoon you. So no, not a lot of mirrors in the bedroom. No, nothing on the ceiling, but you're supposed because it's all a time to relax and put the put your investment into your bed, into your environment of your room. Ensure that it is conducive to your sleep. I love that. That that is that really. And you actually said told me today, and I was really worried because I just put a plant in my new in our new apartment. I put what, and you were like, "Well, as long as there's not more than one plant." So I have no, one. not as long as there's not more than more plants than people. More plants than people. That's what you the said. inmates to outrun the to run the asylum. You've got to have everything's got to be measured and in control. Okay, two people. All right, two plants like that. Got it. Two got plants. it. Okay. Yeah. Well. It's, it's wonderful. And it's very interesting because this is a new apartment. We don't have a lot of stuff and I didn't bring, you know, tons of pictures and stuff like that. I sleep so well in this room and now I'm kind of getting the picture of why I sleep so well. Wow. So cool. So my tip for today mm -hmm. is, you know, talking about mental health, you know, as we always do, um, I kind of want to reach out to anybody who Oh, first, actually, I want to do a little break. So I'm, um, you know, hold that thought. You're gonna have a, you're gonna have a beautiful little tip next. But right now, you are listening to Outcomes the Sun podcast, and we're gonna take a little break. Be sure to come right back. Outcomes the Sun. We're gonna have Meryl Hemingway offering you one of her amazing, glorious tips on health and wellness. Come right back. Okay, so my tip for today, since we've really, really been talking about mental health and, and if anybody's out there suffering, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not trying to prescribe or tell you what to do. This is not a, a professional tip, although it's a tip that has helped me and helped some friends in the past. If you're ever feeling incredibly anxious or, or depressed, and I'm not talking about psychosis. I'm talking about just, you know, regular depression that we all, that we all come up against in our lives or anxiety. 
one of the greatest things that I have learned to do for myself is to go outside, literally go outside, get my bare feet on the ground, either on a beach, the sand, a dirt path, or just my backyard in the grass, right? If it's not winter uh, where you are, but uh, get your feet on the ground, ground yourself because that electromagnetic field that's coming from the earth helps to get rid of the neuroinflammation, which is brain inflammation, so that you can uh, so that you can actually get rid of those negative thoughts. The other tip for anxiety or depression is while you're barefoot, if you can, and you're not afraid of it, walk around a block, you know, walk around your house, walk around your neighborhood for because anytime you move your body, it changes the way that you're thinking. Yes. So if you're depressed or you're anxious, if you move, it will change. You may not feel perfect, but it will change. And then the third thing that is a part of this, if the sun is out, get light in your eyes. Light into your eyes is huge to helping make you feel better. Those three things, I'm telling you, I... A friend of mine, and a really quick little story to highlight this, a friend of mine was on Instagram posting a story and it was so, I was like, what is wrong? He was so, he was crying and he was posting, right? It was a story. I think it was live or something. I called him immediately. I said, are you okay? He goes, I, he lived out in the Pacific Northwest. And it'd been raining for, I guess, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, right? And I suffer from SAD, which is seasonal, uh, seasonal affective disorder. And so I understand it. And I said, look, and I told him these three things to do. I said, get barefoot, go outside, walk around your block. And if there's some sun anywhere, or even if it's just light, just look up into the sky where the, where the light is bright. Well, he was fortunate then that they, they, there was a break in the clouds and he was able to get the sun. He called me within an hour and said, I don't know what I just did, but it shifted completely. So these things are little tips. You know, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not trying to, you know, keep anybody from doing something else. But I know these things work. And and so please, people take care of yourself, make choices that are going to highlight your well-being and your balance. I want to tell you a story. Yes. You just shared. Yes. You, when I met you, however many years ago, I always get confused if it's five or six or seven, but it's been, <laughs> my dad was out visiting from Oklahoma and we had just left you and you had been espousing the benefits of walking barefoot. And, you know, growing up in Oklahoma, we would walk barefoot, but you have to be very selective because there were sticker patches everywhere. <laughs> so my dad and I came home and we were talking about this concept of walking barefoot and because we and how much we used to do it as kids, but we don't do it anymore as adults. So when we got home, I said, Dad, let's take off our shoes and walk around my neighborhood barefoot. So I said, let's take a photo of our bare feet and send it to Marielle, which we did. And my dad sat there, you know, looking down at his feet in his early mid 80s by this point, and he's wiggling his toes and he said, this feels very naughty. And so we walked around the neighborhood and he said, I think she might be onto something. I feel really uh, joyful. I feel really happy. And he kept, could not oh. stop talking about it. This is my 80 some odd year old dad at the time. We walked around and he kept giggling. I said, why do you, why do you keep laughing? And he said, we're barefoot. I mean, he said, I just, <laughs> something that was just so taboo oh and i love it and every once in a while he'd stop and like lift his toes up and down like a flutter this is great <laughs> i love that he said it was naughty i remember that oh my god that, that's awesome everybody get, get, take your shoes off go outside and giggle like you're 85 <laughs> right that's right get out anyway there. or like you're eight uh, either one. It's been such an amazing show and we're so grateful to be here. Thank you all for listening or watching or however you're taking us in out of there in traffic, whatever you're doing. Thank you for coming to Outcomes the Sun podcast. 
please check out the foundation, the Mariel Hemingway Foundation.org. If you're interested in, in, in making a donation so that we can actually become a resource navigator, we would deeply appreciate it. And we love you so much. And we so look forward to next week. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>